I'm going to die with a stranger on the side of a mountain. Once the buzzers are done, I'm, I'll just be hard nipples and carcass. <laughs> just a handful of people know I'm living in San Diego. Only the government, my bank, and the US Postal Service have gotten a location update lately. It's been weeks since I've posted on social media. Sure, I had done the adult things like securing a job and a place to live, but I had no friends. It had been a while since I had to make new friends and certainly not without the security blanket of an extroverted partner or sibling. In my attempts to meet people, I found the women's group at the LGBT Center. I exchanged numbers with an older woman who approached me after I said I was new to town and needed friends. She suggested a hike. After two weeks, we were solid. With four hikes under our belt, I was feeling confidently optimistic about this new friendship. My new friend quickly learns I like animals more than people. She offers to bring her roommate's dog on our adventures, and I am psyched. The dog, Sam, is a medium-sized mutt mix, old, scruffy, and eager to please, much like me. <laughs> the woman is still nameless on my phone, and it's far too late into whatever this is to, for me to ask. <laughs> I'm the passenger princess, she's the navigator. We assume, assume our roles and talk about anything. She's closer to my mom's age of 75 and knows San Diego so well, she tells me to ignore the GPS. <laughs> Week three of this newfound friendship, she sends me a text that says, I know you've already done Cowles Mountain. You'd only have to do four more to complete the five peak challenge at Mission Trails. I don't back down from a challenge. It was game on. There, were four, there we were four hours later, light blue sky and a bird's eye view of San Diego that it looked like a miniature display. The farther we hiked, the smaller the people and cars became until everything was specks in the distance. We finished the 5.9 miles of Piles Peak without breaking a sweat and start to head back down the trail. You know, we could do North Fortuna too, and then you'd only have one peak left. She's tempting me. My new friend already knows I'm a sucker for peer pressure. I'm impressed with her tactics. I don't need much convincing. I'm a glutton for punishment. Besides, it's just another 5.4 miles. We pivot and start the trail toward North Fortuna instead of down the mountain. Time goes by quickly. The colors change in the sky and I start to feel unsure about my decision making. My impulsivity quickly shifted to laziness and exhaustion. I started feeling defeated and anxious. Let, let's go back. I'm getting cold and I have work tomorrow. She looks at me disappointed, but agrees. Okay, I know a shortcut. <laughs> I trust her and follow in line as we venture off the path and pass a collection of runners trying to chase the sunset. We walk and walk and walk and walk more. The brush gets higher. Time passes quickly until I, till I can't see her face, but I can hear her breathing. She sounds panicked and cold. I'm curious, but still confidently following at her heels. Do you know where we are? She pauses and turns around. No. I don't know if she's avoiding my eyes or if it's just too dark to see. I ask almost dumbfounded. So you're saying there's a chance we're lost? Her voice trembles. <laughs> I think so. So, so we're lost? I ask this again, clearly showing my inability to process this shocking information. That's a sign of insanity, right? Asking the same question, expecting a different answer. I ask again, only rephrasing the same question. So there's a chance this wasn't a shortcut? <laughs> My voice shakes as I look down at the ground and remember there is no trail. We are calf deep in shrubs that died weeks ago, now crispy and brittle. I've only done this hike once. I thought we could figure it out. Her tone sounds defeated. 
It now occurs to me to check my phone battery. It's red, hovering at a precarious 5%. Where's your phone? I ask her. My anxiety is a flood of questions. I'm in denial about all the answers. How did I get myself here? How would I follow this stranger down a shortcut? I lead hikes, I know better. I don't do drugs with strangers, why would I go in the woods with them? Why, why would I take a shortcut? Her voice is still shaking as she says, I, I left my phone in the car. Her face has changed. Maybe it's the light, it's the end of August and what was sweltering golden hour is now losing color and quickly dropping temperature. Maybe it's just me subtly, suddenly remembering, I don't know this fucking woman. <laughs> Does your roommate know where we are? We're not alone on this hike. I'm thinking now about Sam, his leash extended as far as it'll go, and I can barely make out his footprints between the brush getting thicker and the sun going down behind the mountain. Someone knows where you are, right? She's looking at me now, <laughs> clearly worried. My phone now reads 4%. When is it too late to call for help? It's 8 p.m., the sky is slowly losing color. I know I need to call someone, and in some sort of twisted joke, Sir Siri suggests I call my ex-wife, who is a 13-year veteran of search and rescue with the US Coast Guard. She picks up on the first ring, and I've never been more thankful. I'm sorry to bother you, but I think I need help. Even in an emergency, I'm apologizing, and I'm not sure what for, needing help, or for finally asking after all these years. She sounds like a stranger, What's wrong, are you okay? I'm lost on the side of a mountain. I went on a hike and my phone is almost dead. Jesus, Aaron, why did you call me? <laughs> call 911. <laughs> Wait, stay on the phone with me. Call 911, add me to the call. So you're telling me there's a chance we can do this without calling 911? <laughs> I wanna make a bad joke about all the other times I've called her first before 911. I'm black, why would I call 911? <laughs> I resist the urge. How much battery do you have left, she asks. 4%. I say it like it's a glass half full. I'm fucking thankful, I have a glass. But reality is another thing I've been avoiding lately. I don't remember exactly what I said to the 911 operator, but within 10 minutes there's a stranger on foot looking for us. It's the longest 10 minutes of my life, and I don't know what face I'm making, but my friend is silently crying. The 911 operator needs a description. Her voice is kind but stern, like this isn't an opportunity for misplaced humor about my shorts being butt scrunch, or how good I look from behind. <laughs> Ma'am, what are you wearing? My voice trembles from the cold. Gray, Gray, gray shorts and a, a green t-shirt that says donor. It's almost like she can see the hem of my shorts teasing the top of my thigh meat. Jesus, Aaron, when are you gonna start wearing clothes? <laughs> she sounds angry but comforting. I'm buying you a turtleneck. I wonder if she'll actually do it or if they'll just bury me in one. <laughs> Neither of you have water, she asks. She was the one responsible for handling everything, from our finances to driving. She would have made me take a camel back and wear pants because that's what she did. She would have protected me until death do us part, but she parted and I had no protection. My tone is unkind. No, I say, I'm with this rando and her roommate's dog. <laughs> the 911 operator interrupts, telling us to stay where we are. They're sending help. She asks for our names, and I'm hit with the reality of the situation. I'm too stressed to speak. <laughs> or maybe embarrassed that I have no idea the name of the woman I drove here, followed down a shortcut, and now was being emergency rescued with. I don't want to identify myself. But my ex gives my name and my status as a living organ donor to the operator. My ex sounds more angry than concerned. 
They have a dog and no water. She doesn't want to be the byline in the article of a wannabe hiker and potential dog napper found dead after being lost in the woods. It's the ranger shouting from abyss. We see you, we'll come to you and lead you back down the trail. I take a deep breath. We are safe. I won't die here as a poster child for organ donation and bad decisions. <laughs> the helicopter light beams down and we hear multiple voices directing us where to go. I can't see my friend, but Sam is now barking at the light and the noise and the sound of rescue gets louder. The helicopter kicks up clouds of dust, blanketing us in light and cold dirt. My name echoes in the distance. I try to follow the sounds in the dark. It's almost 9 p.m. The lights are so bright, I can now make out my friend's face. She looks relieved. We're finally safe. As I follow the beacon of lights overhead, I trip and fall. And naturally, I do what anyone my age does, and I clutch my phone for dear life. <laughs> The helicopter spotlight starts to become brighter from above as I fall and roll, and then everything goes dark again. It's loud and violent. Rock Bottom and I meet often, but I wasn't expecting it to be like this. Aaron, Aaron, are you okay? My friend, who has been mute for what seems like light years, has now found the words to check on my well being. I don't answer. I grasp my phone so tightly that there are claw marks from my acrylic nails in my palm. There are punctures in my skin and my phone is cracked, but it doesn't matter. My phone is dead. My friend is 15 feet up with a dog. She's screaming my name and I'm still silent, frozen in a brush of what if. What if we had not taken the shortcut? What if my wife had never asked for a divorce? What if, what if, what if? I rearrange my body in a fetal position, trying to keep warm. The helicopter speaker is loud and the searchlight takes way too long to find me again. The sound overhead says they can't reach us on foot. The helicopter can't land and we're on our own. I am scared and alone. When I finally stand up, the brush meets my navel, even every move digging more branches into my skin. Over the next few hours, the sounds and lights of our rescue would get louder and quieter again, like a twisted game of Marco Polo. Except we don't know the rules, and this is not a game. It's too late for my ex-wife to save us. I don't know who's calling my name, but it doesn't matter. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. My name sounds like a warning sign, always needing help, but won't ask for it until it's too late. Maybe it's the cold and dehydration, but all I could see was hallucinations of my mother identifying my body. Her face looks disappointed as, I, I, as if I should have known how to dress in the off chance I'd die in the wilderness. <laughs> I black out. I don't remember how long it took to open my mouth and respond to all the people frantically shouting my name. Sometime after 11 p.m., with the help of hel uh, the helicopter spotlight and emergency rescue, we were led back to the trail and off the mountain. My friend and I had become so far separated during my fall and following voices in the dark that they needed another helicopter and ranger to lead her out. It was of course plenty of time for the news helicopters to also arrive and shine their cameras and spotlight as she came down the mountain with Sam. We ended the night with our first ride in a cop car because they had to drive us back to where we had parked miles away. My friend and Sam quietly cried the whole way home. A few weeks later, I went back to the group and the stranger was there. She was wearing a name tag with big black letters, Lorena. She cried uncontrollably and gestured with prayer hands in my direction. She cried uncontrollably and gestured with prayer hands in my direction. I couldn't tell if she was blaming herself or thanking me. It didn't matter. I wouldn't see her or Sam again. I had been blaming everyone except myself. My ex-wife had gotten the brunt of the blame. Sure, 
The stranger had suggested the shortcut, and I had trusted her. But the reality was that I wanted to take the shortcut. I wanted a quick fix for all the careless decisions that had landed me in San Diego, alone, hiking with a stranger. I had been in denial since I realized we were lost on the mountain. Much like the five-year marriage that had dissolved beneath me, I didn't want to admit my part. Eight months later, I was injured and needed emergency surgery. When a bystander gives my description to the 911 op operator, I realize I, again, I am again wearing a graphic t-shirt and butt-enhancing shorts. <laughs> I was in shock, and they would call my ex-wife before I was put under, as she was still my emergency contact. I was conveniently under her insurance, and she would know what to do. It was too late. Our divorce, which had been stalled due to COVID, had ironically been finalized the day before. Leaving me single, without secondary insurance, I woke up from surgery with a cast from my fingers to my armpit on my right arm. Maybe rock bottom wasn't lost in the dark on mission trails, but divorced at 31, relearning how to use my dominant arm again. We've now been divorced for five years, and she's still my emergency contact. She always answers on the first ring, she knows that if I'm calling, it's probably my only option, and there's a pretty big chance it's an emergency. Aaron Roberts, ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Roberts.